Weltmeister, zweiter Teil Alternativen zu einer exportorientierten Handelspolitik. Ich hoffe, alle hatten eine erholsame Pause, sodass wir jetzt wieder äh, neu einschalten an bis ähm, Viertel nach neun. Und wir werden zwei Teile haben. Das eine ist die kino mit Minaraman und das andere ist das Panel zum Ökoexport-Weltmeister Deutschland. Ich habe noch eine Ansage zu machen, und zwar haben wir eure Hausaufgaben nicht gemacht, nicht gelernt, weil das Problem war, oder der Punkt war, dass wir uns gewünscht hätten, dass aus den Workshops ein, zwei Thesen, Forderungen herauskommen würden, die wir dann auf große Plakate kleben könnten und die wir morgen bei der Abschlussaktion dann verwenden könnten. Das scheint uns zu nicht mehr auch sagen lassen, so ganz geklappt zu haben. Von daher gibt es jetzt dort draußen ein paar Stellenmeldungen. Wer eine schöne Idee hat und sagt, das fände ich toll und das sollte da stehen und das sollte dort auch sichtbar werden, der mag das einfach als Vorschlag da eintragen. Das wird dann äh, morgen in irgendeiner Form übertragen, vielleicht nicht alles, je nachdem, was die Leute so hinkriegen, auf größere Wände, sodass wir dann nicht ganz ohne Forderungen bei unserer Abschlussaktion da stehen. Das wäre nett, wenn ihr euch da beteiligen könnt. So, wir haben heute Morgen begonnen mit, und haben einen Blick auf die EU geschaut, hatten dann eine Reihe von Workshops und ich möchte jetzt dazu einladen, einfach einen, mit uns zusammen einen Blick aus dem Süden zu wagen. Wie sieht eigentlich Exportorientierung aus einer Südperspektive aus und findet man das eigentlich nur gut und was hat man sich darunter vorzustellen? Das sind Fragen, die Mina Raman, in die Mina Raman uns einführen wird in einem ersten Teil der Abend. Ähm, Mina Raman kennen vielleicht einige von euch von Ihnen. Mina Raman kommt von Purple Network. Sie selbst arbeitet in Genf, weil sie sehr viel zu WTO und Handelspolitik arbeitet. Ähm, auch die, das Büro von äh, Purple Network ist eigentlich in Milan, in Malaysia. Da kommt sie her und sie war bis vor einigen Jahren noch Präsidentin von Friedrich Hirsch International und der deutsche Ableger davon, den kennen bestimmt alle, das ist nämlich der BUMB und sie ist im Moment noch im Vorstand von Friedrich Hirsch International. So, herzlichen Dank, thank you very much for coming and being here with us and thank you so much. Danke schön, Michael. Great. Guten Abend, did I say it right? <laughs> as, as German as I can be. Um, it's really a privilege to be here. I think uh, largely because I feel very at home with many of our friends um, of the German groups who have campaigned on many issues of trade uh, with us. And so it has been a coming together of people who are very committed to seeing a different world And also I see in the audience many new people and we hope that you can become even bigger friends because what we are fighting and, and what is at stake is um, in fact about life and death as well. Um, and I was just remarking to Michael, it's amazing that uh, there's a lot of people who are interested in trade and law. Usually these are the two most boring subjects in the world. And I'm amazed that uh, you, there's an audience here who actually have come out and are interested in this subject. And believe you me, as, a, as an environmental lawyer and a person who has been working on public interest from the developing world, when I started getting into looking at trade issues myself, it was absolutely a learning experience. And from a learning to a, to a huge concern and a huge outrage, huge anger, which has now made me an activist. So I hope I will make that anger rise in you. That's my task today. Anger to the level of wanting to agitate for change for those of you who are um, young students. And for those, for those of you who are older activists, this is to re-energize. Um, the title, Trade Policy in Crisis, Export Obsession, North and South, as Peter uh, defined it. Now, I am no economist, but from what I have learned, trade, when we talk of trade, there are two parts of trade. One is exports and the other is imports. And what we know is that there must be a balance. And from what I am told by developmental economists,
this, particularly from those of my colleagues from the South Center, that uh, it appears that Germany's obsession, Peter, your word apparently, the obsession of Germany at the moment, has been about generating export surpluses by suppressing wage increases um, in Germany. And this is to make the exports of Germany cheaper. So what has happened as a consequence of this is that Germany does not have enough domestic demand. And because of such a rise in export surpluses, there is need for exporting to others, hence the obsession. And this also is not contributing to, to the development in other countries, as we will see in a short while. And this is also part of the European Union trade strategy, as we talked about this morning, for those of you who were not in that session. Um, John Hillary from World War I very clearly articulated the fact that the European strategy is basically about European corporate interests and about market access, and he even called it neo-imperialism. And there is no understating of that. In fact, for some of us, we call it not just neo-imperialism, but even a new form of colonization in the name of trade, and we will see why. Um, so what we have seen with this kind of German export-led obsession, Germany, in fact, according to some of these development economic economists were saying that Germany should in fact import more, it should be boost its own domestic production and consumption of the right kind of course, and allow for wages to go up more. And it has to rely less on export-led growth and rely more on domestic growth and consumption. On the other hand, there are some countries in the developing world who have less exports and who import very much. And as a result of that, they require more foreign exchange and therefore the push to um, export more or they need to produce more and rely less on imports. So somehow there seems to be this vicious um, cycle that we are caught in. And I'm not saying that uh, exports are always bad, but over-dependence on exports is definitely bad. And this can lead to distortions of various kinds. For example, in Asia, from in, from in Malaysia where I come from, there is this not just German obsession, but our own obsession to produce more and more for exports. For example, timber and agricultural commodities, where this takes place at the expense of lands, where we take away more and more lands from food and turn them into agricultural commodities, or we convert forests on which in, upon which indigenous peoples rely on, and we disrespect their rights, and we turn them into commodities for exports. And many of these countries, like mine included, many of such countries, do not need to depend on exports. But we could produce our own food, but instead of doing that, we are importing a lot of food. Um, Africa, for example, they are also importing loads of food products. And this is particularly dangerous and devastating for Africa because of the highly subsidized imports which comes from Europe. And we will talk more about that later, how the trade policies actually lead to that. Many of you already know this. And so what we see happening is that the call actually for many developing civil society movements and so on is that there is need, there is need to promote local production in agriculture, that we need to ensure food security and livelihoods. Some people are using the term food sovereignty increasingly. Part of this is included in the notion of land reform, agrarian reform, where people have, the uh, farmers have control over land and resources, that developing countries be allowed to have subsidies for agriculture, allow for credit, allow for policy space to, uh, to allow for all this to happen. It's, uh, it's, it's really strange that in the world that we are, we are in now, developing countries are increasingly having to be locked in into loss of policy space. When they have the capacity to determine how we want to move, there are international forces and international agreements which are moving them in the wrong direction and lock them into policies which does not allow that policy space, as some of us know. As we know, the World Bank and the IMF had destroyed food production in large parts of Africa. 
the structural adjustment policies of the World Bank and the IMF basically pushed for reduction in tariffs of agricultural production. And once these countries got free from the IMF or the bank, we thought that the problem would be over. But no, the problem has resurfaced in the form of what is called the economic partnership agreements. And they are driving tariffs down. And we will talk a little bit more of that. Because what the EU so-called economic partnership agreement with Africa is actually pushing the reduction of 80% of goods in Africa down to zero. And this is really the, the destruction of African agriculture and industry. And in, de in developing countries, the export model of development was actually introduced through the IMF and then the World Trade Organization, forcing liberalization, importing more, leading to push for more exports, and the, and the need for foreign exchange. So how, is the, how the, do the trade rules do this? Through the World Trade Organization, through the free trade agreements, through the economic partnership agreements, and they lock in this export obsession and liberalization, and do not, know, do not allow for policy space to develop for the right kind of policies that are needed. So if we look at the existing trade policies being pushed by the World Trade Organization and the bilaterals and the EPAs, you really get very angry. And for some of you, this is a repeat, and I apologize that this is a lesson in repeat in repetition. But for a lot of you, this has to be something that needs to be um, deepened, because it's really outrageous. And the Doha round of the World Trade Organization, some say that we should conclude it as fast as possible. But many of us from civil society and movements in the South and many developing countries are saying this is anti-development. The current Doha development round, as they call it, was never called the development round. But it was the EU and the United States, the developed countries in particular, kept saying Doha development round. And we call it the Doha anti-development because it's anything but development. Just to give you one, some of the few examples, if you look at the agriculture negotiations, I understand there was a workshop which was full of people this afternoon. And um, basically, this is one of the most outrageous uh, of all uh, negotiations. If you look at the uh, domestic subsidies, this has been the most con one of the most controversial aspects of the, of the agriculture negotiations. As we know, the agriculture agreement of the World Trade Organization has a loophole. It allows developed countries to increase their domestic support by shifting the subsidies from one box to another box. Some of you may ask, what's wrong with this? What's wrong in giving subsidies to agriculture? Nothing is wrong if you don't export it and artificially subsidize it and create prices which are lower than the production costs. And this is where the problem happens. So what has been happening in the agricultural negotiations is basically cheating, what many of us call shifting from one box to the other in the name of what they call non -trade dis from trade distorting to non-trade dis distorting. For instance, the EU is relying, has, is relying extensively and it did rely extensively on the use of the blue box, which are considered to be less trade distorting than what they call the amber box. But significantly, there is a rise in the use of the green box subsidies, which is supposed to be not trade distorting, but this is not true. 